Okay. Uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try this again because it, it didn't work the last time because I don't know. I'm technologically not great at this. Um, so I think the last video stream cut out after like seven minutes. So I'm just going to start over with the reading of this article. Um, the article is hyperlinked or is not hyperlinked is linked in the, um, in the description of this video. If you want to follow along, um, that would be great. Um, and the article is written by someone calling themselves Jude Ellison S. Doyle. Um, I understand that this person used to use a different name and then they changed their name, um, but it's listed to Jude Ellison S. Doyle. So that's what I'm gonna call the author. So it's how the far right is turning feminists into fascists. Um, it was published on April Fool's Day. Um, and it, it has a subhead analysis, the terrifying confluence of anti-trans thinkers, American evangelicals, anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists, and global purveyors of dark money poses a much bigger threat than you might realize. So that's the setup for the article. Um, there's a graphic that accompanies this that is a really goofy design, which it looks like it has like KKK people. Um, and tiki torches, and then it has the women symbol with book books burning inside of it. So you're supposed to be like, oh, feminists or KKK people. All right, um, reading. Uh, when I first started asking about the connection between anti-trans politics and the American right wing, my concerns were simple. I'd covered abortion for several years and some of the tactics being used by organized transphobes, noisy protests outside clinics or doxing and harassing doctors were similar enough to the pro-life movements that I expected some groups were working together. I was right. There was a connection, which I've covered already for extra and other outlets. And those are hyperlinked, I guess, to other articles. She's, she's, he, I don't know this person's pronouns, whatever. Um, what I did not expect was that asking researchers to situate anti-trans activists in the context of the broader right would turn out to be one of the scariest questions I'd ever ask. Every researcher I spoke to told me that the situation on the ground was far worse than I thought. Anti-trans activists had not hitched their wagons to the American right wing. The far right was using transphobia to advance their larger agenda, and that agenda was both more violent and a lot more successful than I knew. Okay, so apparently we're going to learn things together. Um, what follow, or maybe not, probably not, but we'll see. What follows is an attempt to summarize that agenda, although the full picture, comprised it is, as it is of activist splinter groups, bizarre conspiracy theories, social media hate campaigns, and titanic global funding initiatives, is both too complex and too weird to ever fully summarize. Um, this person's a journalist. It's the job of journalists to... Um, summarize things that are complex and weird. Like that's your, that's literally your job. Um, so I don't know why you're setting up, like, I'm going to write about a thing, but I can't really do it. Like that doesn't make me trust you as a, as a reliable narrator. Um, it's a story in which eco-fascists infiltrating lesbian folk festivals bump in, up against anti-Semitic conspiracy bloggers and Vladimir Putin's global dark money operations. Um, the infiltrating lesbian folk festivals, I, I, I talked about a little in the, the video stub. Um, it's not really infiltrating a lesbian folk festival. Anyone can buy a ticket to go to a festival. And in most women's music festivals, um, they have the ability for women to put on workshops. Um, wolf bought tickets to the last Mishfest and had a wolf campsite where they did things at the campsite and presentations at the campsite. So like, that's, I don't know that I'd call that infiltrating. Like it, they were openly who they were and talking about who they, you know, what they were talking about then. Um, it wasn't like a secret. Um, and anyone with a passing, you know, interest in learning things would know about deep green resistance long before now, <laughs> like deep green resistance has been around um, and saying the kooky things that they say. Um, so it was known at that time. I don't think it was a secret. 
Um, strange enough that it's hard to take seriously, but very serious and increasingly dangerous to us all. This is how trans eliminationist thought became mainstream politics and it has grave implications, not just for trans people, but for democracy itself. I think that's hyperbolic, but let us see, let us continue. Thus far, I've avoided using the fatal acronym TERF for trans exclusionary radical feminists. The reason is that TERF no longer means the same thing it did 20 or even 10 years ago. As you know, I think most people know TERF wasn't a thing 20 years ago. Um, like it, that acronym is a more recent acronym. Um, but Doyle defines TERF as it still indicates a person, probably a white cis woman, whose politics are defined by obsessive transphobia, but the content of that hatred is very different now. Um, like, okay. Uh, turf is also a slur that's used to um, shut women up who have concerns about, you know, worshiping gender, <laughs> but okay. Uh, the original turfs hailed from a specific strain of trans hostile radical feminism, the kind espoused by certain feminist authors from the 1970s and 80s, like Janice Raymond, whose 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire, notoriously called for morally mandating, in parentheses, trans people out of existence. Um, of course, the actual quote did not say morally mandating trans people out of existence. I think it said morally mandating transgenderism out of existence. Someone should fact check that because it makes a big difference to say, I want to get rid of an idea because I, I think a better, another idea is better um, is a much different statement than saying, I want to get rid of people, which I don't believe Janice Raymond said. The transsexual empire is out of print and it's hard to get a copy of, and it's very expensive to get a copy of. Um, I had a copy of it that I gave away. I, I read it, tried reading it. It's, I'm not that interested, but maybe you are. All right. Their political battles were focused on things like condemning strap-ons as a symbol of male dominance or keeping trans women out of lesbian, the lesbian folk festival, Mishfest. Once again, Mishfest was not a lesbian folk festival. It was the women's Michigan women's music festival for all women. You'd have to be a lesbian to go. Um, they were widely mocked, highly unpopular popular and even at their peak in the 1980s exercised almost no political power. Um, and of course people know if you're widely mocked and highly unpopular, you must be a bad person. I don't know what is the point of this. Um, exercising almost no political power. I mean, that's a whole other statement that can be unpacked, um, but not necessary for reading this article. So how did TERFs become a global threat? Okay, so we're, the setup is now that TERFs are a global threat. Um, that also seems hyperbolic. The answer is, according to researcher Kai Shevers, is that they're not the same people. So Kai Shevers is a detransitioned woman who I think has retransitioned. I don't know how they identify or what their pronouns are, but I do know that the detransitioners as a group emerged around 2013, 2014. I think that they first emerged on Tumblr, um, and honestly, I avoided them as much as possible because they seemed very insular and kind of like, you know, it, not a group that was easily um, approached. So I stayed away from them. The way that detransition women are treated now by gender criticals is that they are like, you know, venerated people because they've gone through this experience and we have to listen to their experience. Um, I, I don't really think that's a good way to decide whether or not someone is worth listening to is because they had an experience. Like, I think, you know, we all have been gifted with brains uh, and endowed with brains to use and think and observe and make criticism. And, um, you know, everyone has the ability to do that. The fact that you went through an experience um, and then went through another experience of detransition um, doesn't make you more informed. And honestly, in some ways, I think it might make you less informed and less trustworthy. Um, so I, I don't know who Kai Shevers is specifically. I just know that that group popped up at the various festivals that I attended and I saw them and they were very much their own group. 
Um, and, you know, then there were some women who embraced the term turf who like, were like, yes, these are the women that are going to change the conversation, blah, blah, blah. That turned out not to be true, but there's still many detransition women on uh, social media platforms that have big audiences because they had this experience and um, they now are talking about it. And that's pretty much all they're offering, which, you know, having an experience is, is, is having an experience. It's not having an analysis. So um, that's that. In the mid 2010s, so I guess this is around 2015, a small group of activists with fascist sympathies, most of them hailing from the environmentalist group Deep Green Resistance, infiltrated the older movement and dragged it to the right over the objections of some members. So um, most of them hailing from DGR, where were the other people hailing from? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think we're going to learn that from this article. And then talking about infiltrating the movement and dragging it to the right over the objections of some members this, this is talking about this discussion as if it's like a membership group. It's not like it's women with opinions that differ and men with opinions that differ. Like there's, there, there, there wasn't like a, a movement, like, Hey, you can join this organization and you're part of the movement. Um, it was just different conversations that people were having. Um, so I'm not sure, like, this makes it sound like a lot more like organized than it was. Um, I would suggest it's more organized now, but anyway, I was hanging out with these transphobic rad radical feminists when the right wing creep happened, Shever said. I know that there's a whole lot of them that actually feel completely fucked over. I mean, I guess that Kai knows those people because Kai was one of those people. I mean, I don't know. This is like Kai Shever's opinion of a thing. Um, but Kai Shever's is being described as a researcher. <laughs> Again, Kai Shevers is someone who had an experience. Kai Shevers researches turfs because she used to be one. She's written extensively about being sucked into a cult-like detransition movement, which convinced young transmasculine people that their dysphoria was caused by misogyny and could only be cured by radical feminism. I mean, I think that's probably, you know, a fair description of the detransitioners um, that they did seem very insular. I also think that's a fair description description of transitioners. Like, again, it's like, you know, this idea, like you're like in this special group and like only you can understand. And there's like language around how you have to talk about things. Like both of them seem very cult-like to me, but um, I'm not a joiner. Okay. Um, she has been my most patient guide through the world of organized transphobia, having previously spoken to me about the rise of anti-trans activism targeting doctors and gender clinics. Every conversation is a whirlwind of names, dates, times, and bizarre blog posts from turf havens. I don't know what a turf haven is. Illuminating the underbelly of an obsessive and increasingly dangerous movement. Um, okay, so now it's a dangerous movement. Um, Turfs were always terrible people, Shevers told me. You know, Kai, maybe you were just a terrible person. I don't know. Like... Do people have to be terrible to have ideas you don't agree with? I don't know. Um, the groups that Shevers first encountered did have some familiarity with feminist thought. This is so condescending also. Like Kai Shevers, I, I am guessing, is much younger than I am and is probably much younger than a lot of these lesbian feminists that she was talking to. Like it's very condescending to, 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 to read this because I'm guessing. Um, then came DGR. All right. I don't know. I had a, your connection is unstable warning. So I think we're back. All right. Um, uh, then came DGR with a whole different set of prior assumptions. DGR members were what Shevers calls eco-fascists. They argued for violence. They recruited from anarchists and environmental groups. According to a timeline put together by researcher Lee Laville, DGR fractured in 2012 due to a series of controversies involving the transphobia of its founders, Lear Keith and Derek Jensen. In 2013, Earth First joined with DGR co-founder Eric McBay in denouncing them. 
And then there's a poll quote. It's a grim irony that by insisting on a feminism without any trans women in it, Terst have wound up constructing the tool by which fascists aim to destroy feminism altogether. No attribution, no attribution to the poll quote. So I'm guessing that's Doyle's analysis their statement. It was also in 2013 that Keith founded the radical feminist organization Women's Liberation Front, or WOLF. Lear Keith began to turn her attention more towards old school TERFs, Shevers says. She had people at the last Mishfest trying to recruit people. WOLF had their own little camp set up, so they started recruiting among transphobic feminists and lesbians, and then once Trump got elected in the Christian right and all those other groups got more powerful and more bold, that's when they started making the right-wing alliances. It is true that Wolf had a um, camp inside of Mishfest. They, like any other group of women, um, camped together, um, and they also put on their mini Wolf Fest where they, they had different talks. I went to their campsite, and I, I can't remember if I did a little talk or if I just went to someone's talk, um, and my impression was most of the women that were there um, were women who had not previously been to Mishfest, like that they were there to go because it was known it was the last Mishfest and they wanted to go. Um, and I have no doubt they recruited. They like, you know, they passed around a sheet and say, put your email on that, which is not in and of itself, um, you know, a scary thing. Like that's what groups do. Um Okay. After Trump's election, Wolf pivoted hard to the right. Uh, that's very true. And that is true of a lot of, of people in this conversation. Um, I spoke at the last Mishfest, not, um, and I decided to stop talking about this issue. And I, you know, when Trump was elected, it seemed to me like there were much bigger things to be focused on than this issue. Like, um, so I, you know, I stopped really paying attention to this issue because I was concerned about other things, but Wolf pivoted hard to the right. And we all know that's true. Like that is a true statement. You can observe this. Um, Co-founder Karadansky appeared on Tucker Carlson tonight to rail against the trans agenda. I do not think that Karadansky was a co-founder of Wolf. I don't recall her being involved um, with Wolf for being on the emails about like, hey, you know, Lear sent out an email, like we want to form a group. I don't think Kara Dansky was on those emails. I'd have to check that. Um, so I don't think that's accurate. Also, I don't know when Kara Dansky first appeared on Tucker Carlson. Um, so that's something that could have easily been filled in here. I, I think it'd be helpful to fill it in to get a sense of the timeline. Uh, and in 2017, the organization filed a joint amicus brief with the Conservative Family Policy Alliance to oppose the effort to open girls' locker rooms and showers to boys who say they identify as girls and vice versa. These new alliances effectively brought the Turfs into the American right wing. It also brought them into power. Um, I think that's that's not, a, not something that can be disputed. Like, they did do that, and they have a much bigger platform now. Like, that is true. All right. When you look at who's calling themselves a GC feminist, gender critical feminist these days, their version of radical feminism is Wolf's. Shever says they're not really reading a lot of Janice Raymond. Um, so I, I wouldn't even ca call the gender criticals feminists. Like a lot of gender criticals don't embrace that. They just are gender critical. And saying gender critical feminist is like saying feminist feminist because all feminism, like depending, even whatever wing of feminism you look at, like has an analysis of gender that is critical. Um, third wave feminist uh, analysis of gender is different from second wave, um, but they have an analysis. So I wouldn't even call them gender critical feminists. That's my opinion. Um, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of the people calling themselves radical feminists probably aren't reading a lot of Janice Raymond either. <laughs> All right. One need not weep for the original flavor TERFs, whose intentions towards trans women in particular were always genocidal. This is such bullshit hyperbole. I, 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 this is a shameful statement because if you read, if you actually read a lot of radical feminists, like they're very compassionate towards, um, people who identify as transgender. I mean, there's some that I would describe as nuts, um, but this is just like a, 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 just a general hyperbolic statement. And again, we're back to, J to Janice Raymond. 
who said explicitly that her goal was for trans people to be, no longer exist. Again, I don't think Janice Raymond was advocating for people not to exist. I think she's advocating for an idea not to exist, which again, feminists advocate for lots of things not to exist, including like, you know, sexual trafficking, pornography, like things that are generally considered to be bad for women. Um, okay. So yeah, in 1979, that hatred was much less potent than it is today. Turfism was one pocket of a relatively powerless movement, which did not have the reach nor backing of the broader right wing. Yet as a pre-existing hate group on the left, turfs were able to easily, turfs were incredibly easy for fascists to infiltrate and absorb. So again, okay, women having opinions on the internet is a hate group. All right. A 2020 article from Radix Journal, a far-right publication founded by the neo-Nazi Richard Spencer, lays out a strategy for doing just that. In the article entitled The Turf to Dissident Right Pipeline, author Kat S. <laughs> notes that TERF's insistence on biological sex is an immutable binary. All men depraved and violent, all women fragile victims may make it easier to convince them of other biological hierarchies. Their insistence on seeing trans women as violent men in particular can be weaponized against men of color and turned into overt white supremacy. It doesn't take any thinking woman long to see the ex exactly which men are committing violent crime and the majority of partner violence and race realism is a natural next step. So that was a quote, which I'm, I think is attributable to Kat S. I have not read this article. I, I have to say, I think it sounds, it sounds like it's a it's a premise that I think has probably demonstrated to be true in some ways, um, which we're seeing now with um, the mocking of uh, I see a lot of mocking of Black Lives Matters by gender criticals, not people who identify as feminists, but gender criticals talking about the woke left. Um, the woke left is generally a, a term, umbrella term used to describe someone who, you know, stands for human rights for people um, based on race, sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, and the woke left also is used to talk about people who think COVID is real. <laughs> so um, it's not a leap to think that those people saying the woke left also think Black Lives Matter is, you know, sowing dis discord in the country, in the United States. Um, also the stuff with objecting to critical race theory, um, allegedly being taught to kindergartners, which doesn't happen. Um, so I would commend to you this turf to dissident right pipeline. If you'd like to read it, it's hyperlinked in Doyle's article. Ultimately, uh, the article reasons, and this is the article from the, the Nazi publication, it should be easy to convince TERFs that supporting the rights of biological women means rejecting the mid to late 20th century Jewish-led feminist theory, particularly the corporate, corporate slavery of work outside the home, in favor of accepting their biologically ordained role as wife, wives and mothers. And I think this is also something that we're seeing. I, um, I saw a tweet uh, recently, although the tweet itself is from a couple of years ago um, from Sharon Davies. Um, this is a terrible, this is, this is like a not feminist statement. Here's the tweet. If you put two biological females on an Island, humanity dies out parentheses, but they'll talk loads. If you get a biological male, and a trans woman on an island, humanity dies out. But if you put a male and a female, there we might stand a chance, providing they can fish, of course. Binary sex matters. Like, this, that is like a not feminist statement <laughs> at all. And enjoy your incest, Sharon. I, I, like, like, that kind of stuff makes me nuts. Like, you see that kind of stuff, and you see gender criticals like, that's right blah, 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 sex matters. I'm like, sex is not the only thing that matters. Okay. It's not. So anyway, so I, I can see this. Um, I can see that this happening. 
And I think it should give anyone pause when you see statements like that. Like, don't check your brain at the door. Like, think about what is this person saying? Is this person standing for me? Also, the like embedded sexism, like two women will chat loads, like, right? Because women are chatty. Like, that's gender, Sharon. Anyway, that was stupid. It makes me sick that that woman has a platform. But here we are. Okay. Um, a pro-family, pro-natalist movement requires some degree of female participation, Kat S. writes, and reframing the patriarchy paradigm is essential. Ultimately, TERFs must be led to see patriarchy as a system where men's urges and strengths are allowed to flourish and channeled into healthy outlets and women are protected and respected for their maternal reality and the gifts our unique biology affords. So this is absolutely happening in the conversation right now. Um, and if you look at like there's like a, a Facebook group, gender critical women, like you find lots of posts that echo these themes and like healthy masculinity, um, which again, like it's gender. How about just healthy people? Okay. I don't know. All right. It's a grim irony that by insisting on a feminism without any trans women in it, Turfs have wound up constructing the tool by which fascists aim to destroy feminism altogether. Still, it's not news that online Nazis have crazy ideas. Could this actually work? To talk about that, we have to pull back and look at the global picture. Honestly, if you want to talk about what is ending feminism, I would say it's third wave feminism has ended feminism with this idea um, that you can identify with a sex and become that sex is like the biggest magical thinking leap, I think in like modern, like analytical thought, like it's just a leap beyond. And we're starting to see now the backlash to that and the backlash to that um, is, is the, the gender critical stuff is backlash, like right wing stuff is backlash, but that idea, like, I don't know who decided that was a good idea. Cause there were many people in the gay and lesbian community who were like, this is a bad idea. Like, don't do this, please don't do this. And there, there would have been other ways to thread the needle to get rights for trans people. Because I think if you don't think trans people should be able to live and work in society, like, I think you're a bigot. Um, and I've said that before, and this has been my public position on this for like decades at this point, like trans people do actually exist. You can't make them not exist because you don't like it. Like there are people who are, are Catholic that you might not like, and they also exist. Um, but we live in a pluralistic society. Like people have the right to live their lives as they choose. We don't dictate to people how they should live their lives. Um, but the, the third wave feminist movement did is dictating how people should talk about things and you, you can't do that <laughs> like you that's an authoritarian way of getting a result and now we have like backlash and like the right wing has been fighting you know to to like push against feminism and push against like uh, uh, gay rights like all the stuff they've been fighting against and now they have this issue and so doyle is blaming turfs for that and that's absurd because TERFs have been warning about this for a while to say like this crazy way of, of viewing the world is bad. Like it's bad for a lot of reasons. It's bad because it's not true, but it's also bad because, you know, here we are in 2022 and none of the things that are happen happening are terribly surprising to me um, given, you know, the nature of politics. So I put the blame for where we are now squarely at the doorstep of third wave feminists. So enjoy. Now the, the blame for specific acts that people are doing now by collaborating with the right wing, that's on them. Like what Wolf is doing is on Wolf and I hope Wolf comes crashing down. And I hope a lot of these groups come crashing down and you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. We'll see. All right. So now we're talking about the global picture. Turfs and organized anti-trans groups are only one part of the global right-wing struggle against so-called, quote, gender ideology, roughly the confluence of abortion rights, women's rights, and LGBTQ rights, with trans people seeming to inspire particular fury. The idea of gender ideology or originates in the Catholic Church. So, so I, I'm hoping that this article is going to talk about that. 
which is why it's very disheartening to see women who are like, I'm a feminist talk about, I'm against gender ideology. I'm like, do you know what that means? Cause I don't think you know what you're saying. So you should learn what that means. Um, back to Doyle. That struggle is well organized, well funded and global. Um, a 2021 report from the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Rights found that between 2009 and 2018, Europe had received uh, $707 million in anti-gender funding. Again, this comprises of initiatives against abortion and LGBTQ rights more broadly, as well as anti-trans funding. To the opponents of gender ideology, they're all the same thing. Outside of Europe itself, there were two countries pouring money into the campaign, the United States and Russia. Um, and just a, like a footnote here, it, it is absolutely true um, that opponents of LGBT, like they view gay men and lesbians and trans people as the same people, like dirty people, sinner people, um, which is why like it makes a certain amount of sense for uh, LGBs to ally with T's because a lot of LGBs are also gender nonconforming. So that umbrella always made sense to me, like theoretically speaking, where it started to make less sense is when the umbrella, the T umbrella just got so broad, like as to capture every last thing. And I think that was a strategic mistake um, that I think we'll be paying for down the road. And this is specifically with regard to legislative initiatives. And, you know, that's why we have the pushback on, you know, you say you're a woman because you say you're a woman and that makes you a woman. Like, again, that's silly magical thinking that we don't encourage in toddlers. Um, and here we have it as a basis for a movement, which again, big mistake. All right. American anti-gender funding comes largely from the Christian right. The EPF report lists donors like the Heritage Foundation, the American Center for Law and Justice, and the Alliance Defending Freedom, who are also highly active in anti-abortion and anti-trans politics at home. The Alliance Defending Freedom, for instance, has been credited with creating the legislative templates to inundate U.S. state legislatures with a barrage of transphobic sports bans. I have no re I, I have no reason to doubt that whatsoever, <laughs> like because that's that's how legislation often gets written is some organization that has an interest will create model legislation and then shop it around to legislators because legislators are notoriously stupid, lazy. Uh, and did I say stupid? Like they're, they're political people. Like they just, their, their job is to get elected and then to raise money to get reelected. Like it's very, very rare that you find a, an elected official that is thoughtful and not wholly self-interested. And I realize I'm making a generalization. And so I should gender identity and a lot of the, the bans on tr discrimination in the first place as it was NGLTF was shopping around their stupid definition. Um, okay. Russian involvement is harder to figure out, not least because that money is often run through laundromats intended to disguise its associations. The EPF argues that for Putin, anti-LGBTQ measures are not only desirable in themselves, Russia's treatment of queers is famously horrific, but also as a means to destabilize the globe. Specifically, Russia has a habit of boosting far-right populist political parties with an explicitly disruptive agenda. If otherwise functioning democracies can be, can be torn apart over civil rights, that creates chaos, which ultimately benefits Russia. Certainly, the United States was weakened by the Trump years, arguably the most successful example of this strategy. Um, I believe that there's a lot been written about that. So that's not surprising. Uh, LGB drop the T comments. Most conservatives like Ben Shapiro and Jordan P Peterson have a live and let live mindset towards trans people, just like most feminists. Um, I don't think that's true about Ben Shapiro. Like Ben Shapiro, I don't, I haven't looked at Jordan Peterson, but Ben Shapiro's public statements are very demeaning towards trans people. One would think if he was truly live and let, let live and let live, he wouldn't be talking about them obsessively and in such derogatory ways. Live and let live suggests that you don't actually have an opinion that you air publicly about the way someone else lives their life. If you know what their opinion is, they're not living and letting them live. Like they're they're actually mocking them. 
Um, and I would say there's a lot of feminists who aren't living that live towards trans people either. I would say that they are mocking trans people in some instances. Um, again, that's separate from having an analysis of gender where you talk about gender and how gender is a system and da, 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 da. But like if your social media feeds like consists of like memes making fun of trans people, um, I would say you're not living, you're not letting some, you're not a live and let live kind of person. But that's just my opinion. All right. Trying to follow these connections lands you in a human centipede chain. Why? Why would you say that? Like, why? Wherein Russian oligarchs dump dark money into U.S. evangelical think tanks and the evangelicals send that money back over to the Atlantic to fund TERFs. A law banning teachers from mentioning homosexuality in the classroom appears first in Hungary, then in Florida. Youth transition is banned in the UK, then restored, and then banned in Idaho. Vladimir Putin defends his invasion of Ukraine, comparing the cancellation of J.K. Rowling to that of Russia, which I think is silly because I don't think anyone could argue J.K. Rowling has been canceled. Um, the same regressive ideas swirl back and forth between continents like ocean currents and with or without conscious coordination. We all end up living in the same mess. Even the most extreme and implausible right-wing ideas have reached an institutional backing that they might not otherwise have had, and a global slide into fascism goes from unthinkable to likely. This is where things get weird. Um, and again, like following up on, on this, you, like the idea that you would have this don't say gay bill, which I can't tell you how many gender criticals I'd be like, the bill doesn't use the words don't say gay. It's like, can you read? The legislation, which says there's there's no mention, and and I've posted this on Twitter. Um, there's no to be no mention of sexual orientation of gender identity, um, unless age appropriate, K through three. Um, the purpose of that is to chill speech, and it seems to me if you're like coming from a left perspective, you would be concerned about chilling speech. But we now have these gender criticals that are all talking about parental rights and safeguarding as if the idea of mentioning that gay people exist is somehow unsafe for kids. Like this is what they're saying. That is what you're aligning yourself with when you're embracing this. Like that is not feminism at all. Like gay people existing is not a sexual fact. It's just a fact, just like, you know, a straight person existing. It's just a fact. And like, again, you can point to like, like, you know, we'll get, you know, the gay movement is like all in your face and all this shit. Like, okay. But like, there are literally millions of gay people in the world that are literally just living their lives. Um, LGB drop the T says, I don't know everything about Ben Shapiro, but I've seen him talk respectfully with trans people and he would respect their pronouns. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, this is where things get weird. Back to the article. The deep green resistance member who's had the biggest influence on the gender critical movement is a woman named Jennifer Bielik, whose author biography calls her an investigative journalist, artist, and concerned citizen, quote, read blogger. So here Doyle is like putting her down because she's just a blogger. And whose 2018 article for The Federalist, Who Are the Rich White Men Institutionalizing Transgender Ideology?, tilted organized transphobia firmly into the realm of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. In that article, Bielik puts forth the basics of her staggeringly bizarre worldview, a cabal of transhumanist billionaires, wealthy individuals supposedly devoted to helping humanity transcend its status as an organic species, like hedge fund tycoon George Soros, philanthropist Warren and Peter Buffett, and wealthy trans women Martine Rothblatt and Jennifer Pritzker. Yes, this paragraph gets crazier as you go has infiltrated the gay community and taken over the medical industrial complex, creating a predatory gender industry that convinces cis people they need to transition with the ultimate goal of normalizing body dissociation and extreme body modifications, putting Google chips in our heads, and I swear to God, enslaving the human race by merging man with machine. Felix theories inspire a mockery whenever someone coughs them up on social media. 
and they should, they're incredibly silly, but the trope of a sinister moneyed elite plotting the destruction of humanity from the shadows of a, is a familiar, is a familiar from Nazi propaganda. Nearly all of the billionaires on Bielik's list are, as Shevers points out, Jewish, Jewish, trans, feminine, or gay. One thing that's, it's crucial to understand about the far right, the extreme right, the Nazi guys is the way that they obsessively see absolutely fucking everything as a Jewish plot, says author and hate researcher Talia Lavin, author of Culture Warlords, My Journey into the Dark Web of White Supremacy. And the existence of trans people is a huge one. So Jennifer Bielek is a nut case, period. And the fact that she has had any traction peddling her nutty bullshit is incredible to me. Um, I've never met her. I don't know her. Um, I had a, I observed her like online hoping that someone would beat me up at the Supreme court protest in 2019. Um, so I suggest that she's a violent individual who likes to make threats um, but I don't know her and I, I honestly, like I've read her stuff and I'm like, this woman is like making sh like, she's just like, she's, she's knitting a nutty quilt. Um, and she is influential among gender critical. So that is a fact. All right. Back to Talia Lavin. Um, Lavin cites the 1933 burning of Magnus Hirschfeld's archives. Hirschfeld, a German Jewish doctor, was a groundbreaking and remarkably sympathetic researcher of transgender identity. His was the first clinic in the world to provide gender affirming surgery. Then the Nazis burned his work, leaving a hole in history. To trans people, this looks like proof of erasure, but to a Nazi, Lavin says, it means something different. The presence of a Jewish doctor indicates that the existence of trans people was invented by people like Hirschfeld in order to undermine white masculinity and destroy the white family. And then there's a pull quote. I spoke to researchers in multiple countries for this piece, and all of them agreed that anti-trans activists were becoming increasingly comfortable with presenting their arguments in a white supremacist framework. So that's Doyle's statement. Back to the article. Um Presenting transition care as an attack on white fertility and white birth rates specifically. Sometimes this is subtle, irreversible damage, a 2020 book in which author Abigail Schreier portrays youth transition as an imminent threat to the fertility of our daughters, infa infamously uses a cover illustration of a young white girl with her uterus scooped out of her body. Um, yeah. <laughs> At the extremes, things get more overt. Alex Aaron, the gender mapper organizer who has led the charge against Planned Parenthood as the apex of the trans lobby, also insists transition is only a threat to white children. Black youth are not transitioning, she writes, and that's also hyperlinked. One thing that this article does not do is actually research where these people came from. Like, where did Jennifer Bielek come from? Because my understanding is she was like a photographer, or is a photographer? Like, where does she come from? Was it like she became interested in DGR and like she organically grew up? I don't know. Does anyone know? I don't know. And Alex Aaron, like, who is that? Where did she come from? Now, I understand that she is affiliated with a group called like Partners for Ethical Care or something, but where did they come from and who funds them? Like, if you're going to do this kind of article, like that's the type of stuff you could follow up on. But Doyle has already told us that it's too complex for her to do. So I don't know. Um, Abigail Schreier is, so someone said, isn't Abigail Schreier Jewish? LOL. Again, I think the fact that someone has a specific identity does not make them like, it's not like a, a, a magical cloak that allows them to, to do things that, and to, they can like fend off accusations of anti-Semitism. Like the fact that someone is gay doesn't mean they can't be homophobic. Like there's a lot of really homophobic gay people um, who are out now peddling all sorts of bullshit. So I don't know if she is or she isn't. Like, I don't know anything about her um, except that her dad is a judge in Maryland or was a judge in Maryland. Um, but the fact that you're a member of a group does not give you immunity. Um from being anti-Semitic. All right. 
This obsessive focus on white fertility is, is of a piece with fascist propaganda about being overrun or replaced by people of color. This is, this is an awkward statement. I don't know what she's trying to say. Okay, here's a quote from Mallory Moore. There is a growing body of propaganda about white genocide. Uh, we queer and trans people and femini feminists for that matter are refusing to do our national duty to breed. So there's, there's kind of a leap here. Like they could have developed this more. Um, someone asked, what is true trans? How is it defined and what is it based on? Um, if someone wants to answer the true trans thing in the chat, that would be great. All right. Shever says that the conspiratorial thinking that dominates turf circles easily extends to incorporate other civil rights movements. Whereas trans people might be framed as a plan to weaken the white race through sexual degeneracy, movements like Black Lives Matter are suspected of being unwitting tools of the trans. Okay, back to, this is Shevers. They're talking about Black Lives Matters being co-opted by the trans lobby. Again, it's very similar to Nazi propaganda. This Jewish elite has captured this black civil rights movement and it's actually just an attack on white people. At this point, transphobia no longer seems like an adequate description of the problem. Transphobia implies hating trans people. I mean, transphobia is something that's used to describe anyone who has like questions about what they're talking about. So transphobia has become kind of meaningless and I think we should retire it. Um, Janessa Jokey says, nobody has a definition of true trans because it doesn't exist. I mean, I think true trans is a way that people describe themselves like, you know, people describing themselves like that description exists. Like, I, I don't really care. Like, I don't think it matters from like, it, that's like a cultural conversation. Um, and LGB dropped the T says, Abigail caring about the fertility of trans identifying girls doesn't mean she's saying it's a Jewish attack on white fertility. Yeah, absolutely. But also like, why is, why is she obsessed with the fertility of anybody? Like, it, you know, if we're feminists, like, and, and this, I think Abigail Schreier is not a feminist, like women don't exist to be fertile. Like girls don't, like fertility is not like the end all of being female or being alive. Like, why is that, why is that the focus? If you have an answer, I would love to hear it. Like, why is that the focus? Like, that seems to be the focus of a lot of gender critical um, discussion is like, oh, fertility. And uh, why is that your focus? Like, there's more to being a woman than having children. Um, anyway, I find that I've had two children. Like, I've given birth twice. Um, so, like, you know, that doesn't insulate me from being called all sorts of names. Cause I'm like, you know, the obsession with fertility um, is, is a little like reductive. Right. So I don't know. All right. Let's go back. Transphobia implies hating trans people, believing that the existence of trans people is a Jewish plot to destroy the white race by lowering white assigned female at birth's fertility is to be crude. A whole new level up. Uh, LGB dropped the T. That's important for most people. Yes, fertility is certainly an important part of the human experience. But what the conversation around these these people who are wanting to transition, it's assumed that they haven't had those conversations with themselves. Like it's assuming that you know better than them. Like, and I don't know that you can assume that. Like, I don't know that you should assume that someone knows better about what you, is important to you as a person. And that's, that's the objection I have to a lot of the gender critical stuff is it's just as authoritarian as the transgender side of the equation. Like stop assuming you know better what an individual wants to do with their life because you get one life. Like it's your life to live and you can live it however you want to live. Why is it your job to tell someone not to do that thing? It's not my job. It's not my business. And I think that is the thing that's coming off is like, very authoritarian and like for right wingers like that's right wing politics it's all about on social issues telling you what to do and again i think this is why it was a mistake for the third wave feminists to to be, start telling people like you're a bigot if you don't call a man a woman who says he's a woman 
Like that's also telling people what to do. Like you shouldn't do that. Like we have laws that tell people what to do. And those laws are generally around government. The good laws are around governing conduct. Like you shouldn't murder someone, right? Like that's a good law. Like, why would you have a law that says, you know, you, you, you have to call, you have to use, you know, specific speech to refer to someone. So this is where I think you, uh, the trans movement and the gender critical is actually belong common. Um, adults must assume what's better for children to a certain extent. LGB dropped the T. That is absolutely right. And in the United States, and I don't know where you're based, in the United States, every single state has a body of case law and family law that talks about like best interests of the child and decision making. So there are processes that exist currently that allow for those conversations. And what the laws that are being passed now that says no transition for children, that takes that conversation, which involves the family experts, the court, that takes that conversation away from them and puts it the state. The state decides you can't do that. And I don't think that's a good idea because where does that stop? Like, where does it stop? So, you know, I don't know better what to do for, uh, you know, family X than the people in family X. I don't know family X. All right. Uh, yet these ideas are reaching the mainstream, laundered through a sympathetic com commentary that scrubs off their far right associations. For instance, as researcher Krista Peterson has documented, Krista, P Krista Peterson is a nutcase too. All right. Helen Joyce's recent book, Trans, repeats Felix Jewish billionaire's theories without citing her by name, which I understand really pissed off Jennifer Bielek. So I think that's really funny. Um, all right. Joyce was then reviewed by anti-trans commentator Jesse Single in the New York Times and Single while calling Joyce's, can I have a cup of coffee? Yeah. Thanks, honey. A single while calling Joyce's book an intelligent, thorough re rejoinder to an idea that has swept across much of the liberal world seemingly overnight, neglected to mention Jewish billionaires at all. Dig two inches down and you'll find the Nazis, but on the surface, it looks like reasonable debate. Um, okay. There's a lot of debate about this issue without Nazis. And if you listen to the feminists that were talking about this decades ago, you might know that. But you were spending all that time calling those feminists transphobes and bigots and hateful that you didn't listen to what they were saying. So fuck you is what I say to that. All right. Um, I've lost my place. It's a debate that trans people are losing, which brings us to the grimmest part of all this, how fascist plans for eliminating trans people have become part of the American mainstream. Um, so we're actually in this discussion right now. And I don't know that I would conclude that trans people are losing, just like I don't know that I would conclude that gay people are losing. But I do agree that rights for LGBT people are in a very tender area like marriage equality is very very new in the history of humankind um very very new and i would say fragile and interestingly you've had the um confirmation process of justice um jackson and that's been really fucked up because <laughs> It turns out that it was Kara Dansky, a gender critical, who got that nutbag Tennessee senator to ask the baiting question, what is a woman, which resulted in the judge answering the way she did. And I didn't like her answer, um, but that was the answer. And Wolf, not, I don't know Wolf, that other organization, Women's Declaration, thank you. Um, they put out a press release saying that they, it's the Mishfest Cup, they put out a press release saying that they oppose her nomination on that sole basis, which again is like so, so stupid and so short-sighted and makes you think that maybe they're not for women's rights after all because they're obsessed with this one issue. All right. 
It's no coincidence that much of this story revolves around the election of Donald Trump. The Trump administration emboldened fascist and far right groups across the board, and it also brought them closer to mainstream political power than ever before. Witness the growing number of Nazis and QAnon conspiracy theorists in American legislatures. The far right takeover of the Republican Party has not been painless. Never Trump conservatives feel that overt white supremacists make them look bad. And hate group members think that moderate conservatives are sellouts. Still, transphobia has provided a point of penetration where the far right and mainstream conservatives are united. Rhetoric that was once the exclusive province of the far right has come to dominate mainstream U.S. debates around anti-trans or anti-LGBTQ. And then it says 2S. Is that two-spirit? That's Okay. Legislation. Witness how fertility rates and questions of sterilizing children come to dominate any discussion of youth transition. In Florida, the state's notorious don't say gay bill was framed by Governor Ron DeSantis, spokesperson as an anti-grooming bill, and all opponents were cast as pedophiles. When they say pedophile, they mean someone who shouldn't be allowed to live, Lavin says. This quote-unquote deep state of QAnon is engaged in pedophilia. The Democratic Party is engaged in mass pedophilia. The default rhetorical move for far-right people is everyone is a pedophile and pedophiles should be killed. Um, that's what I mean when I say annihilatory rhetoric, rhetoric, Lavin says. Like, this is to protect parents and children. As if queer people, trans people aren't parents and children. They fall outside the remit of the Volk. Um, Jessica Gonzalez cannot catch. Yeah. Um, this will be on my YouTube page if you want to watch my nonsense later. Um, I just do these when I have time to do it. Um, LGB drop the T says half the country is right wing. That's just a fact. People need to accept. We need to work together if we want to fend off the far left and far right. Um, LGB drop the T. I, I'm assuming you're in the United States because you said half the country is right wing. So, um, yeah, people do need to learn to work together. I totally agree with that. Like we live in a democracy and we live in a, a state of compromise. Like it's one thing to have like a, a theoretical discussion. It's another thing to actually live like as a person who needs things from other people and who has things other people need from you. Like, Learning to live and with one another despite our differences is like a big part of being a human. Um, and that's the problem with a lot of the trans side and the gender critical side is they, I don't know, how do, how do they have any friends? Like, how do they, how do they actually live in community? Like, how do you actually like function? Um, so yeah, I don't disagree with you at all on that. Um, SM worries about the backlash on the LGBT community because some of the more extreme trans activism and policies being pushed more though. I worry about the gay community splintering over this crap. Yep. I agree. I agree with, I have the same fears. Um, and you know, like I've been out for a long time and like things used to be really bad. Like it used to be illegal, like to, to have sex, <laughs> like it's a gay person. Like that was a real thing. Um, and you could get fired from your job very easily. And um, I've, you know, I've been a gender nonconforming lesbian a really long time. And like, things are better in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, they're getting worse again. Um, and yes, Catherine Acosta is doing a discussion on right wingers this weekend, which women should check out. There's a Facebook group called Actual Left. Um, feminism or something, gender critical feminism. And it's a useful group where these conversations are. She rejects the only work within the left approach right now. Okay. I, I think everyone has their own journey. Um, I reject working with homophobic organizations and anti-feminist organizations. Um, I think that's a mistake to do. All right. Here is where I pull back dizzied and admit something that sounds paranoid even as I say it. This agenda is clearly already genocidal where trans people are concerned, but it also seems likely to escalate and find new targets. Anti-gender activism already includes attacks on abortion, 
women's rights and the rights of cis queer people. Ugh. There's no cis queer per- like what is this shit? Like stop using your your bullshit language, Doyle. Like talk like a person that wants to communicate with people that actually, you know, might be influenced. But when you use this kind of language, people are like, oh, they're using magic words that make no sense to me. Um, all of which are being rolled back in the United States. Um, the seething hatred of non-white and Jewish people, which provides the subtext for these movements, must sooner or later become their text. Doyle says, I'm frightened for myself. But I'm more frightened because the longer I look at this, the more I concur with gender theorist Judith Butler that trans people might not be the point of anti-trans fascism at all. We are simply the most popular means by which fascists concoct a world of multiple imminent threats to make the case for authoritarian rule and censorship. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's worth looking at that. I keep going back to my conversation. Uh, oh, here we have the concept of force teaming. I I just want to say LGBT as a group makes a lot of sense and is not, I wouldn't say, force teaming um, because a lot of LGBT people are gender nonconforming. And that keeps getting forgotten in this whole stupid language around cis and trans. A lot of gender gender nonconforming people are lesbian or gay. So it makes a certain amount of theoretical sense that you might ally with people who identify as trans. No people or were LGBT and then were also T. So I don't think forced teaming is, is ac an accurate way to describe those alliances. There are some issues that we're going to disagree on, um, for sure. Your wife is butch. The fact that your wife is butch doesn't make your opinion more valid. <laughs> just to say that. Just like the fact that I'm butch doesn't make my opinion more valid. Like, that's identity stuff. Like, good job marrying a butch, though, because they're great. Um, but forced teaming is a thing that has been advanced as, like, well, Gay people should never work with trans people because our interests don't align. That is just not true. Our interests do align often. And this is the thing about trying to work in community. Sometimes we might be aligned and sometimes we might not be aligned. Like sometimes our interests do align and sometimes they don't. It's okay to say no sometimes and like maybe yes other times. Like you don't have to be like, no, we can never work together. Like this is why like people should like, hold on loosely like because there's room to there's room for like okay well in this instance like why wouldn't i support a bill to ban discrimination like in employment for trans people if you know if i can do that like why wouldn't you support that like it made no sense to me that any feminist would be objecting to trans people having the right to work like why would you do that like yes i understand you don't agree with like gender identity neither do i but I think as a feminist, like you don't think that people should be unemployed because they're trans, right? I mean, maybe you do. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's the reality. I don't know. John Quill Jones does not believe trans is a real thing. I mean, there's a, it's a fact that people are out there calling themselves trans. So whether or not you think it's a real thing is like not wholly relevant. It's a cultural phenomena that exists. Um, and LGB dropped the T says most right wingers don't want to go back to that. They just want the LGBTQ movement to leave them alone. See, I would believe that except that they're passing laws now that are like actually bringing us back to that. Like that don't say gay bill in Florida is not like a status quo, like back to the way it was. It's like, it's more than that. It's marginalizing gay and lesbian people. So if right wingers don't want to marginalize gay and lesbian people, they would actually do nothing um, legislatively, and they would explore that through the options that currently exist. Like, again, every state in the United States has a system for how schools operate and like departments of education and school board meetings are public and you can go to a school board meeting and like see what's going on. And also if you're a parent and have kids, 
Are, aren't you talking to your kids about what's going on in school? Like there's ways to get to like whatever you think the problem is without passing a very heavy handed bill. The fact that they're passing a heavy handed bill because they view LGBT people as such a threat to children. That's the marginalization. And so I don't agree with you that, you know, they want to be left alone. I want to be left the fuck alone. <laughs> like, like, I don't want to be called a pedophile for existing. I don't want to be like treated as like a sexualized person because I'm gay. Like, that's like the least interesting thing about me and probably most of you. But when I'm around people who aren't gay, like the fact that I'm gay is like a very exciting fact for them. And like, that is really tedious. And, you know, I can't speak for what most gay people want, but I don't want to be treated in any way because of that fact. This LGB drop the T says the bill is for crazy TikTok teachers to make their children believe they are trans. I mean, I don't think you need a law for that. Like, I think you actually have other mechanisms short of passing a law um, to get to that. So we're probably not going to agree about that. I also find it funny that all these Republicans that are like small government are all in favor of passing laws when it has to do with LGBT things. All right. Uh, small children shouldn't be teached about sex, whether straight or gay. Once again, it's taught about sex. And also being gay is not being taught. Like the fact of someone being gay isn't teaching anyone about sex. It's like teaching people like black people exist. Catholic people exist. Jewish people exist. Gay people exist. Like it's not about sex. I, I'm sorry for being snarky. I know it was a typo. It's it's not about sex, right? Jessica Gonzalez, it's okay to mostly say no and say yes on this one very narrow specific thing. And if you're going to do that, you have to be very, very clear in your communication about what you're coming from. And you also have to be prepared for calling out very publicly when people engage in bad behavior. And I don't see a lot of that. I do not see a lot of that among whatever this online, like gender critical, I don't see a lot of people standing up and saying, Hey, that seems mean or wrong. All right. LGB dropped the T is saying that they want to teach BDSM to children. I'm just going to, that's bullshit. Like if you have an actual site, please drop it in the comments, but teaching BDSM to children is not a thing that happens like in the United States on like any widespread basis. Uh, okay. Let's finish this article. Cause I have to work. Um, I keep going back to my conversation with Lavin about the Hirschfeld archives. Burning them was one of the first things the Nazis did. And it certainly isn't what we remember them for. The fact that trans people make an easy first target doesn't mean we will be the last or even the most important ones. The longer I look at this, the more information I assemble, the more my mind drifts back to that long ago fire. The thing is, fire always spreads. Look around you and see what's burning. What a lazy fucking rhetorical device. And you could have spent that time like trying to do a little bit more research on some of these connections and people, but instead you were like, this will be very pretty to end my article with. Um, so there's a lot of hyperbole in this article. It's linked in the comments um, or it's linked in the description um, to read it and, you know, kick the tires of it and don't just reject it outright because it was published in a publication you think has politics you don't like. Cause sometimes you find useful things in there, like use your brain and decide, like sort the truth from the lies and the hyperbole from the fact and, you know, Anyway, that's all. Thank you for tuning in to the, you know, few people who did.